Okay, um, so the next part is just knowing we know now what disrespect and abuse is and what it can look like. So what are the solutions? How do we make it better? How do we fix this? Okay. But before that? I think we have to start by accepting that this behavior or what happened between that healthcare worker and Timisa is absolutely unacceptable. So we're recognizing that there is certainly a problem. Do you agree, or do we not have a problem when this is concerned? We do have a problem, okay? And as you said, we need to fix it. We need to make that right. How? I think uh, the opening reaction or action to the observed problem is very important. If while the teenager comes in, in the help of vomiting and labor, and uh, we understand that it's frustration in the environment, and I'm also carrying my baggage. The opening statement for me should try and break the ice and avoid going in the wrong direction. Down that road. It's like if, if, if you receive visitors at your house, they knock on the door, you go open the door, and you tell them, hello, there's tea, there's coffee, help yourself and you walk off how would you feel as the visitor okay all right so it is about as you say the start the kickoff is so important how we receive that patient okay so we need to know I mean we, we realize that it is a problem it does exist okay and apart from being skilled in what we do, we need to be aware and mindful of the interpersonal aspects of providing that care. That you could be saving a life, but to do it with disrespect, I think it's rather pointless. Not so. Okay. Every time patients are treated like this, it is a human rights violation. So our health system, our health workers violate human rights every single minute of the day somewhere in South Africa. Okay. And if people are going to be treated badly, they're not going to come. They're going to die. So we can't save their lives because of our attitudes and the way we engage with them. Because I would rather die than go there, than be treated badly. Okay. So that is about the patients, but it's also about you as the provider. That you need to be feel taken care of by your managers, by your superiors, by the structures around you that w within which you work. Okay. So it's not just about how you relate to the patient, it's about how you as a, as a provider feel taken care of. So it's a management issue as well. Okay. So this is some work that was done by um, Dr. Yogan Pillay. And um, the three things that need to be in place for safe and respectful childbirth is the enabling environment. And the enabling environment, um, okay, I'll speak more to this in the next slide. So it's the enabling environment, clinical care provision, and then communication and companionship. So when we talk about the enabling environment, this is the job of the managers. Do the staff have what they need in order to do their job? If you don't have what you need in order to do your job, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to you? You're going to get frustrated. And where do the frustrations get taken out of? The patients, the dog at home, your children family, so those things frustrate you. You couldn't do what you are trained to do because you don't have what you need. Okay, so we're not just talking to health workers here, the cold face health, the cold face health workers, we're talking to the powers that be as well. They're just as responsible for what's happening out there. Am I making sense? Yes. 
All right, because we can't be blaming the health workers. Managers who are health professionals by training also have ethical duties towards the end user. Not so. Okay. So if you don't have what you need, you can't do what you're supposed to do. The next thing is that you should be able to do your job properly. So you need to make sure that you are adequately skilled and trained okay, to provide the care that the women need. Managers, leaders on shifts, um, operational managers, those kinds of people, they need to provide opportunities for you to go for this training and to provide ongoing support and supervision. Are you, are you going in the right direction? Am I, as a manager, open to you asking questions or as the district clinical specialist? Can people approach me? Am I approachable for them to ask questions if they're not sure? Okay. We know clinical governance is happening because with the DCSTs around the country, they provide the clinical governance to the care that's provided. Are you taking a bit of strain? You want to stand up a bit? Just stand for a second, take a stretch, and then you sit down. I promise you it will work. It's a bit warm in here, isn't it? Okay. Communication. So important. And when we say communication, what do we mean? As that opening state that, that opening statement as you said. Right? And when we talk about communication, it's not just what we say, it's how we project ourselves. Okay, we'll talk more about that just now. Um, and when it comes to communication, it's not only the professionals, the health professionals, but other staff as well. The security guard who opens the gate. Hey, you're not supposed to be, your sister's not going to see you, it's half past 11 already. Not so. Come back tomorrow. Or the reception staff that must do folders and stuff like that. Tell you, just wait there. At tea time, I'm going now. Just wait. This is what happens. Because all of those are that first encounters. And it can be soured right from the beginning. And it's not even the health worker. Okay. So everybody needs to be involved. And this training lends itself to that. That reception staff, administrative staff can be included in the training. Now it's all fine and well to want to do these things, but how do you know it's working? You need to? Feedback, yeah. But not just with the staff. You need to get the sense of the patient's experience. All right, I will talk a little bit more about that. <coughs> okay. So this is a little video um, that we did, I'd like to show you. 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 That we did, I'd like to show you.